Am I on? Very good. Excellent. Did you, did you hear it? We couldn't hear any of that. Did you hear it? Oh, good. Um, okay, so, uh, but it was, there were some great people. I mean, we just know that they were saying good things, don't we? Because they, they just seem nice people. Okay, so, um, welcome to Design Manchester. It's annual great debate. I'm Matthew Taylor, Chief Executive uh, of the RSA. Welcome to our global audience, as this debate is being streamed live on designmcr.com. Can you, hear, can you hear me, by the way? This is, this is good fun. Um, and uh, connected to many more via our Twitter hashtag, which is hashtag DDM15Debate. Uh, and I'm RSA Matthew, if you want to add to my growing list of followers. Um, I'd like to express our thanks to Maria Bolshaw, the director of the Whitworth, for allowing us to host this debate in this beautiful place, recently redesigned and refurbished by Stuart McKnight. At, is it MUMA or M-U-M-A? Anyway, what is it? Uh, the second year running, we've held our debate in a sterling prize-nominated building. The topic is the values of design. And this is of particular interest to me. It says it here, but actually it's true. Uh, since the RSA has a long history of engagement with design and its role in enriching and improving our society, uh, extending even into the design of society itself. Uh, we were, of course, also involved and hosted the City Growth Commission, which played a major part in delivering city devolution. Um, and was the subject of last year's Design Manchester debate. And also at the RSA, we are in the midst of a consultation with our fellows and our royal designers, whose master, Malcolm Garrett, is in the audience this evening, and we're exploring the ways in which the notion of design has expanded into new disciplines, such as digital interaction, service design, and it's become an important consideration, some might even say a fetish, amongst governments and public services, as well as for culture and commerce. And we're looking to formulate a robust definition of design and its value to society. Now, I'm going to introduce the panel to you in a moment. Not that they really need much introduction. They're all stars in the firm moment. But I'm going to, let's do a bit of audience participation first. Shall we do a bit of audience participation? Come on, then. OK. How many of you are designers or have aspirations to become designers? Put your hands up. Hmm. Yeah, about a quarter, I'd say. A quarter to a fifth. OK. Uh, how many of you... I'm never quite sure what design means. <laughs> There's th four of us. That's five of us. Five of us. Okay, I think we're the ones telling the truth. Okay. And then how many of you think that designers are great, but they have a bit of a habit of being rather full of themselves? <laughs> yeah, there's more. There's more. Okay. <laughs> Including some of the designers, which is reassuring to see. Okay. So, um, with me on the panel tonight uh, are John Mathers, the Chief Executive of the Design Council, powerful advocate for design and its value to the UK economy. Jessica Bowles, the head of policy at Manchester City Council. In the midst of a consultation, this one is about the new draft Manchester strategy. I read it on the train here. Formulated by the leaders group of the Greater Manchester Authorities, the strategy will set the framework for the city for the next 10 years and concludes the word design 15 times. I counted. Oh, yeah. thank you very much. That's fine. Um, so tonight is an opportunity to make the voices of design heard in that consultation. So uh, we're grateful, very grateful to Jessica for jumping into the breach at short notice as Sir Howard Bernstein has had to go abroad. As head of the policy lab at the Cabin office, Andreas Jodwonk brings the principles of design thinking to how public services are delivered. You're coming to speak us, to us at the RSA soon, aren't you? We've given you a prize, haven't we? Because you're so brilliant. So it's great to see you here. And Lou Cordwell is the founder and chief executive of Manchester Digital Design Group, Magnetic North, putting design thinking into practice every day with innovative work. Are you all happy with the way in which I've described you? Good. Awesome. Uh, now, in the audience, we've got many people who are well informed, have strong opinions about this topic, and I'm sure are going to be hearing. Why don't you give the panel a round of applause just to give them some encouragement? Yeah, so <laughs> It's Friday night, folks. Let's, let's get a bit of a Friday night feeling going to it. Okay, so we've got a, a set of uh, questions. And in kind of true question time format, uh, th these are questions that have been submitted by you, by members of the audience. So all I have to do is to call the questioner, and they'll get up, and according to my notes, they will ask the question that's in front of me. But they may not. Who knows? It's a magical mystery tour. So the first question is from Tom Clark. Is Tom Clark here? Very good. Oh, Tom, you've even got the mic. It's, it's all been sorted, hasn't it? Okay, so Tom, please ask your question to the panel. And is its economic value more important than its social value to the country? Word perfect, Tom. Word perfect. Were you reading? No. Oh, I love the fact that you memorised that. That's fantastic. Okay, so let's go, let's go this way. We'll start this way. John. Okay. Um, well, 
I think... Uh, you may need to put the microphone in a different... Are you, we, eight to, we were told eight, six to eight oh, inches okay, from fine. our mouth, just okay. so you know. Just, no All right, so. Okay, so um, I think I've been invited onto this panel to talk specifically about the economic value of design. So I might, if I may, um, give you some facts and figures about some of the important... Um, uh, statistics around the Northwest and Manchester in particular, because I thought I, th I thought you might be quite interested in it. Um, but I do want to um, particularly address the, um, the the question that you asked, which is, the, you know, is it is it about economic value or is it about social value? And I think the answer. I'm willing to bet fifty pounds you say both. Yes. Good. So that's okay, fine. That's fifty quid. I'm up. So uh, it, it is, and there are there are other people on the panel who I think can answer the the, the social value one as well as, if not better than than I can. So. If I may, may I just give you some, uh, what I think are quite interesting stats about the Northwest. And it's, it's um, and let me just give the context for it, because if um, the government is stating that by 2030, they're aiming to increase the long-term growth rate of the Northwest to at least the forecast rate of the whole UK, which means that it's talking about an extra 18 billion pounds worth of value in the Northwest. And amongst that, by the end of the next parliament, they're aiming to ensure that 100,000 people in the Northwest are in employment more than there are at the moment. Now, those are bloody big targets. And, and I suppose the question I'm about to raise is, can design play any part in actually reaching those targets? Well, the answer is yes, I think it can. We've done this piece of research called the design economy. I can't um, leave any copies of it because it's officially launched on Thursday of next week, but I have been able to drag some interesting statistics out of it. Um, and it, 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 on a national scale, it's, there are some great statistics about um, the role that design plays, adding something like 72 billion pounds worth of value to the economy. And that's about the way that design is a driver of growth in many, many industries like aerospace, automotive, digital, gaming, etc. But it also shows that um, design makes up a substantial contribution to the Northwest and Manchester in particular, and there's, I think, massive potential for growth, which could help the city and the wider region. So, for example, between 2010 and 2014, this area, the Northwest, saw a 45% increase in the number of design firms, uh, taking it to a total of something like 5,500 design firms. Now, that's you know, a lot of, a lot of um, jobs. 143,000 people adding, adding over 30,000 new jobs uh, in that five-year period. Um, and, you know, if, if the government aims to add 100,000 jobs to the Northwest, then arguably design and design-related industries could actually make a huge contribution to that, to that target. Um, more specifically, just looking at Manchester, because that is where we are after all. Um, Manchester accounts for a third of all design firms and a third of design workers in the Northwest. Um, it's got, there's a, Manchester has got one of the greatest concentrations of design firms and employment in the UK, and it looks like an upward trend as well because um, if you look at the ranking from 2011 to 2014, Manchester rank, now ranks um, eighth or ninth um, in the whole country. And there's lots of other stuff I, I, could, uh, I could go on about. But I think the, the one I just wanted to add is that, um, particularly given the government's obsession at the moment with productivity um, and the productivity of our, worker, of, of, of our workforce, the great news for me is that um, the average worker in the, design in, in the design economy, as we're calling it, um, is something around £42,000 whereas the average UK worker is around 33,000. So if ever there was an argument to say that design actually is not only a great um, uh, contributor to the economy, but also a great contributor to the productivity of the way that we, um, the way that we work in the UK, then, then that, is, that is the case. Very good. I think you've done some homework on that question. <laughs> Very good. The panel, don't all feel the need to be so incredibly authoritative and detailed in your responses. <laughs> feel free to be slightly more spontaneous. In, uh, but that was, very, that was an incredibly useful baseline for us to understand the importance of design in the Manchester economy. Jessica, is there anything you want to add? Yeah, I think um, 
I, I haven't got a prepared piece that's quite as long or, or full of stats. Um, I, I was thinking about this, this idea of um, design being either economic value or social value. And actually, the way I see it is um, that having great design and designers in the city is absolutely critical to our future success. It's kind of what makes us interesting place, a place that people want to be, live, come to, stay in, visit, invest in. And actually, that sort of sense of a vibrant, buzzy, um, exciting city is, is really fueled by designers and great design. Another word that appears quite a lot in your report, in fact, it occurs 17 times, is the word distinctive, mm. which I thought was very interesting, because mm. arguably one of the problems with economic regeneration in Britain over the last 50, 60 years, actually, has been a kind of uh, uniformity to it, that everyone has the same plans, people go about things, people, I think it was referred to in America once as Stadia and Starbucks, a kind of mm. identical way of doing things. So it's interesting to see the word distinctive popping up so often in your strategy. But I think that's absolutely, you know, I think, I think it's at the heart of what we need to be about as, as a city. And if you think about the long-term future and how you're going to trade in the world, what's, what's going to, we're not going to compete with London, we're not a megalith, we're not a really large city of that sort, but actually those mid-sized cities what do they how do they interact what's what's their rationale and raison d'etre going to be and actually I think that's about being a, an individual place a distinctive place that people find interest in and not being a, a, a sort of samey high street I think some bits of Manchester like Northern Quarter which we've kind of left to ferment um, and be keep their distinctiveness and their edginess and haven't sort of created an identikit high street have been really part of what makes Manchester edgy and interesting and successful. Very good. Now Andrew you're you're responsible for getting people in government to think seriously about design as something which is part of the kind of policy process. I guess the test for you on this social and economic question is did the Treasury take you seriously? Um, so I should probably therefore start by saying I'm here as me, not as a government opinion. So please okay. don't take what, I'm, what I say tonight as policy. Um, but of course, uh, economics are at the core of value. And, uh, you know, Raymond Lowry said the most beautiful curve in the world is an upward sales graph. So, you know, design on many levels was born of that kind of economic uh, grounding in the 20s and beyond and obviously going back. But it stands for so much more than just money. Uh, so I do, of course, and I've been a proponent of design for public good for 10 years or more. Um, so I do think it's important to obviously have both. But I would add a third. And those who have read Matthew's wonderful blog today... Um, will also be aware of the importance of the environment, uh, the triple bottom line. Uh, so we talk about growth and prosperity, but actually 80% of the impact of any product or service is determined in the design phase. And that's an OECD study that looked into the environmental impact. So, um, you know, design is born of this kind of principle of economic growth. Uh, if you look at uh, the DMI in America, they talk about design-led businesses outperforming others by 200%. And of course, good design does bring that kind of financial benefits. But I think one of the things I've discovered working previously at Design Council is quite often in the public sector, we were interested in the opposite effect in a way. Uh, the most beautiful curve sometimes was a, a a downward demand curve, if you like. Um, my work in designing out superbugs, uh, designing out crime. We were designing away some of the problems that we face in society, which is a very different lens. So um, I think also I would therefore make sure that we don't just start with that, those two points. We also look to the environmental question, and that would take us all the way to a circular economy. So I think in the future, if uh, Raymond Lowy were here today, we'd be looking at design as a driver of value, but its impact in terms of its circularity. Very good. By the way, if you think you're going to ingratiate yourself with me by mentioning the fact that you've read my blog, you're entirely correct. Um, <laughs> Lou, I'm economic, in trouble. social, I'm not both, both, environmental? <laughs> Uh, I, th I think, you know, Tom, Tom's question, in a sense it's easy to gravitate to the economic, isn't it, because we can quantify it and uh, we can grab hold of it, and everybody feels comfortable with the notion of it, its tangible value because it has its own sector and it creates jobs and it creates wealth. And I think, obviously, that, that's absolutely true in this city and, and lots of other cities. But 
I guess design is, has become almost like technology in the sense of it is its own discrete sector, but it is also a horizontal across all other sectors. So it's pretty hard now to think of any sector, whether that's science or uh, uh, environmental studies or uh, you know uh, astrophysics or graphene you know, or any of the things we've seen where there isn't a role for design thinking at some point in that business. And sometimes it's really bad design thinking and sometimes it's brilliant design thinking. But I think design now exists almost as this omnipresent function uh, that's adding economic value to lots of sectors as well as its own kind of growing burgeoning sector. But in a sense, the, the most interesting line of value, I guess, is the bit that can't be quantified, it is the social value. And, um, and it's easy to forget, I guess, just the value of having things that are nicely designed and the, the kind of happiness index of just being surrounded by thing, beautiful places like this, kind of gravitating towards beautiful buildings and cities that are well designed or products that are well designed. So, so I, I suppose the answer to the question is there are, there's both, it's just one's really easy to quantify and the other is, is easily kind of dismissed because it can't be quantified, but I, I would argue is equally important. Now that's, I, find that, I find that so interesting. So are you saying that design has, as it were, a, a virtue regardless of its context? So uh, the design of a stealth bomber, is a, if it's a beautifully designed stealth bomber, it, it, there is virtue to the design of that stealth bomber. Well, somebody went through a design process, didn't they? Somebody thought, what's it going to look like? And they made some decisions. I mean, I was having a discussion with somebody at Hyper Island the other day about who designed the spikes outside Selfridges to stop people sleeping there. And we were saying, you know, that's really interesting. It's some designer somewhere took some money to design some spikes to stop somebody sleeping outside Selfridge. And it's like, wow, okay, so there's a social responsibility aspect then to being a good designer. So, so I think the, 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 you know, the kind of uh, social index is kind of interwoven into the design process. And, and, but there are clearly social values that we can't quantify that even if design isn't your trade, but you spend your weekend or your home or your life is enriched by design, then design has a value. In, in our universe. It's very interesting. Our conversation with the RDIs that Malcolm is the, the master of is, is that we're a charity, so we've urged that to become a royal designer, you need to demonstrate benign social impact. And there are some people in the RDIs who say, no, we don't. We are just great designers. That is enough yeah. benign social impact. So it's yeah. kind of interesting. This is a very interesting debate, I think. Now, what, what we're going to do in future is I'm only going to take two people from the panel on each of the other questions so that there's going to be lots more time for anybody else to come in. But who wants to come in on economic, social, is design an inherent good? Anything they want to say, sing a song, demonstrate that you're alive in some way. I don't mind what you do, really, but it would be nice to see something happen out in the audience. No? Ah, oh, good. There we go. Here comes a roving mic. Tell us who you are as well. Uh, uh, Dominic Sagan, uh, architect, uh, involved in setting up Northern Court Association, which kind of spearheaded the regeneration of, of that area now, which is kind of what I'm talking about, is that, in a way, Manchester culture, the kind of the grassroots and the youth culture and the music culture has kind of helped to kind of reinvent it and regenerate the city. And, you know, it has kind of become the new cotton. Um, it is the kind of leisure industry, is the new kind of industry. And in a way, this creativity has, has helped, you know, the regeneration of the city. And Manchester's always been quite innovative, inventive, creative, radical in its approach to solving problems, social problems. Um, and you have to look at the trade union movement, suffragette movement, and all those kind of things. And I think we need to be careful, because I think we need to look at how the creativity um, can be used in a positive way for such instances like as the homeless people. The city council have spent £100,000 making up new rules, new laws, trying to kind of evict the homeless, kind of criminalising poverty in a way. And I think, you know, if you were quite clever in spending all that money, you could spend a few bobs, get a few kind of bobs, a few kind of little sinks and kitchens and tents, and actually in a brownfield site, create somewhere that, you know, people could go and it'd be kind of creative, positive and cheaper. <laughs> And I'm kind of worried about the whole effect of the, the investment, which is good, how, in a way, we might kowtow to the corporate mentality and the 1% versus the 9%. And I don't think we really want being counters, accountants, and the corporate kind of institution design in our city. And I'm a little bit worried, because um, we've had Manchester and Gunchester, and I'm worried we might get kind of Branchester and kind of Blanchester, and we might have our spirit squashed, and I'm a bit scared. That's, that's, I, so, uh, Jessica, just back to you. 
there's stuff in your strategy about social inclusion mm -hmm. and inequality and poverty, mm -hmm. and there's stuff about design and the city being beautiful, but I suppose if I was being kind of critical, I'd say these feel like they're separate sections. What about this question of is design relevant also to the, 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 the strategy is deeply committed to tackling inequality and exclusion. Is design part of that? Yeah. I think it absolutely it is part of that, and um, the city strategy, as we as we were shaping it and forming it, it could have been um, seen as a city centre strategy, and then the rest of Manchester, and it really needed not to be that. And I don't think that we should be um, uh, creating great design just in some parts of the city and, and those places that are more excluded um, not being able to benefit from that too. And design goes beyond the physical realm, although it's absolutely critical there too. Um, it goes into kind of how services run, whether you're designing things that are great for people to use. Now, I don't know that the public sector has got that um, right <laughs> over over the years, but actually that... that um, a commitment to designing things that people can use well, that people can access, I think is um, ought to be at the heart of what we're doing over the next 10 years. So um, I think I think this, this is, if the city doesn't get this right, we'll end up with growing inequality. And that is not great for the city. It's not great for our economic health. It's not great for our social health. It's not great for us as, as what we want to be for Manchester. And that shouldn't be an, an in, a city with um, inequity um, at its heart. And as you said, it's a radical city. It's had a radical and progressive history. And I think it's got a radical and progressive future. Very good. Now, the next question I'm going to direct to the two Manchester-based people on the panel, and the one after that to the two... Uh, nationally focused people. So, Carol, Carol Isherwood, where are you? Very good, right at the back of the room. Here comes your mic. Hello. Uh, so, this is to Jessica and Lou, I think, mainly. Go on. Okay. With opportunities like the new factory cultural centre and the £3 billion development of the corridor, should we favour Manchester based architects over global superstars? Ah, there we go. That's quite a controversial question. Let Lou. I'd argue they're one in the same thing. Oh, clever, clever. <laughs> very clever, very clever. We like that. Spontaneous round of applause. Yep. And the answer is yes, I think. I think there's a certain... So if there are two, hang on, there's two, there's an architecture competition, there's two designs, yeah. they're there. What, what is it? If, if one's just 2% better than the other, but the other one's from Manchester, you go for the Manchester one, or if is, do they have to be exactly the same, then you choose them. I mean, what is it? Positive action, positive discrimination? What is it? Well, I, generally, as a rule, I, I'm not necessarily in favour of positive discrimination, but I, th I think there are examples of where perhaps the city's got it wrong by not... Uh, by being too kind of international, shall I say, in the way that it looks to commission original work. So I think I think... If we want to make world-class work and we want the city to be known as a world-class uh, city that produces great design thinking and great creativity, and there is a little bit of helping people along the way because what we definitely have is the raw talent. So it's not sympathy and it's not kind of... Um, you know, propping people up because they're never going to be capable otherwise. It's giving people that first step on the ladder. And, and I think there, is, there are so many examples in other places where that absolutely happens because the geography of not being in a certain place is seen as being too much of a barrier to consider those people who, who aren't within a certain location. That I think we, sh we should actively... Because we've got this one massive injection, like factory in the corridor and, and, and you know, home, and we've, we're in this window... We may never see another window like this again for a long time. It absolutely should be used to stimulate local talent at all development stages and to encourage a spirit of this being a city where if you want to come and make your name and be world-class in your design trade, whatever bit of, of, of design it is that you want to focus in, this is the place you can do it. So, so Jessica, yeah. is there anything about that you don't agree with? <laughs> um, uh, I'm going to slightly struggle here, um, having <laughs> being here as a city council um, representative, I suppose, and thinking about the EU procurement rules that sit behind my poor um, my poor colleagues who who make these decisions and have to abide by them. Um, 
Absolutely, I think that we need to be growing talent that can compete in these competitions, and absolutely they do. And I think the, the architecture um, competitions are just one aspect of it. It goes absolutely through a whole range of um, the, the development and design and delivery stages. And one of the things I'm proudest about for Manchester is that when we, um, when we, took, when we did the work to bring the Town Hall um, extension and Central Library to beautiful fabulously designed um, buildings from the 30s back to life. Um, that was done with Manchester people with 100 apprentices working within um, that, that um, uh, project who were all getting real kind of high quality craft skills in, in bringing, in, use, in working in um, these listed buildings. Now I think that's, I think that's um, a, a great example of Manchester really thinking about its own people and encouraging and building from the, from the real grassroots. So I think that's, that's what I'd want to Very add. good. I mean there's nothing more crass than asking for a vote on a complex topic in order just to make sure the audience <laughs> is engaged. So that's what I'm going to do. Um, all those who are in favour of the idea that we should favour Manchester-based architects over global superstars. All those in favour of that proposition, put your hands up. And all those who think that we should go for the global superstars rather than the Manchester-based architects. Okay, it's a parochial audience. I know you all think that uh, Lou is absolutely right, that there is the, these are the same group, but uh, that's, that's good. That's uh, interesting. Okay, now, uh, Andy Cayley. Where's Andy? Ah. And I'm going to address your question, well, you're going to address your question primarily to John and Andrea. The devolution of the health budget is going to cause a lot of problems. One of them is the shortfall in the actual budget and the challenge that how design and tech services can overcome this and in particular addressing the issues of the ageing population. Great. So, Andrea. You work with government departments. I'm sure you've been asked to look at issues around health, social care, population ageing. What can design bring to a challenge like that? Um, so there's, I mean, clearly quite a long history of design and ageing through inclusive design. So that's certainly a kind of foundation, if you like. Um, but specifically, and I think if your question's about devolution and health, is that right? I didn't quite hear... Well, it's just about the fact Budgets, that now Manchester's going to have more control over health. this. Yes. Yeah. I mean, I, I live in Cornwall, and uh, Cornwall has its own Cornwall deal. So when I worked at Cornwall Council, health and social care integration was something uh, that we looked at, and we also looked specifically at ageing, um, in a much smaller sense probably than uh, the, the Manchester deal. Um, but one of the things that strikes me is about a, a bigger question about our role as citizens um, in our own lives and if you look to places like Sweden they're experimenting with things like patient hotels where the family are actually encouraged into the environment of the health care and health giving and caregiving um, in a way that our traditional hospitals here are not designed to do uh, and I know Simon Stevens and others are very passionate about people-centered care but the reality is that our health system was designed for a different era and a time when people spent a small amount of time in, in a kind of acute setting, whereas many of the conditions that we're trying to uh, support are chronic. So I think that this is a wider thing around a shift in the way that care is given and health, and I think it calls more upon citizens. So um, this is not a government stat. This is something... Uh, I just kind of thought I'd do a little rough reckoning on, really. Um, and that is, if you look at the NHS, the NHS is, I think, the second largest organisation in the world after the Indian Railways, something like that. And I heard this stat once. It's a big organisation. There are huge numbers of people who work in the NHS. And, of course, they do amazing work. But the UK adult population is 35 times the size of the NHS. So the answer really has to be how can we design better ways that we, the public, can organise our lives to support a smaller and reformed and transformed uh, public service? Um, and I think in that sense, there is, a, there is a wider question about things like the trust economy, the way um, that people are supported to live lives. I mean, a lot of people in this country will die um, in a hospital setting. 
And yet most people do not want to die in a hospital setting. So there are some fundamental ways, and I know there are some interesting projects going on looking at palliative care uh, with a design lens. And, and this is, I think, back to the very first question. When you look at the role of design for social good, it starts to invoke all these wider questions about the way that we live our lives. So um, it's a kind of broad way of answering it, but I think design is fundamental to that in, in every sense. I think Simon Stevens has said, hasn't he, that what he calls patient power is what he, he's used the phrase the renewable energy of the NHS, so I think is an interesting I mean, phrase. I, John. Oh, go on. No, go well, on. I was just going to say, you know, I, I um, had uh, dinner recently with Simon Stevens at the Palace of Westminster, and I, it was a group of, um, it was organised uh, on the blood cancers charity, and it was a group of uh, consultants, and, and I put the challenge to them, what if you went into your uh, GP surgery, and instead of the current experience, what if, it's, if the experience was the patient will see you now? You know, how would we really fundamentally change the system to be more patient-centred? Um, and and these, are, you know, these are really big questions. A, sim a very simple question like that could turn the whole system on its head. Very good. Nice phrase. John? Um, I completely concur with um, uh, everything that Andrea is uh, saying. And I, I think it's, uh, it, it's the need for us to take uh, control back into our own hands that's the critical thing. And completely rethink and redesign the systems that are out there at the moment. Uh, the, the, I, I could, again, quote lots of statistics, but, I mean, here's, here's a really scary one. In not too many years, over 50% of the population in the UK will be over 50 years old. So there's this tsunami of older people which is going to hit our National Health Service. I don't think any of us have got any idea of what the real dangers of this actually are, but it's, it's, it really is quite scary. And I think we've got to put the power of the solutions back into the people who, are, who have the problems. I, we've been doing a, a, a piece of work looking at uh, something called Design for Care, which is how you can actually start to put the power back into the older population. And my favorite quote was somebody who said, I'm not old, I'm 94. Um, and uh, she had um, some great ideas about the things that would make a difference to her life. And so, in a sense, what we've got to start to do is use fundamental design principles of understanding the users, listening to the users, and actually helping them to develop the solutions that will make a difference. Um, the good news is this, this piece of work that we're doing um, has Greater Manchester as one of the areas that we're going to work in. Uh, interestingly, Andrea and I were talking, uh, Cornwall and um, Devon are the, is the other area, so we're looking at um, how we can develop ideas around both a rural setting and, a, and an urban setting. And the most important thing that we've got to be able to do is develop solutions that are scalable, because there's just um, far too much of um, uh, individual solutions being developed in individual areas and then the lessons and the learnings that we can learn just not being taken to a national level and that has got to change because we don't have the time for it not to change. Can I ask Jessica, just I can ask you a very specific yeah. question about this which is that I, I was saddened to see a couple of weeks ago that one of the country's leading design consultancies that focuses on user-driven design service design basically is folded. And one of the reasons it's folded is because it's very difficult to get people to invest in innovation and experimentation. As part of your plan, because you talk about these things in your plan, you talk about you know, user-driven services, you talk about community engagement, there's a kind of you know, progressive big society feel to it to a certain extent. What about investment, though, in innovation and experimentation? Because these things don't happen by, by magic. They don't. And um, if we don't do something different with health and social care, we're going to be bust. <laughs> That's the, the simple truth of it. And we need to do things in a, in a radically different way. And when you come and look at public services, you can see that they don't join up in the right way. They don't take a, a patient-centered perspective, a person-centered perspective, or allow communities to do what communities are able to do. Um, and I think um, we, I, I've been doing a lot of work at the moment around health innovation Manchester, which is the idea that you need to really drive um, innovation into practice at scale within the health and social care settings. And we're looking at how we can really incentivize that and bring the best thinking and practice um, into our um, devolution um, arrangements around health and social care. I think it's tremendous exciting. I think it will be um, somewhere that creates a test bed for people to come and try and experiment and we'll be putting backing behind that um, and that's, that I think is, is the only way we can address this. Uh, 
from my perspective, and I, I spent 15 years working in the civil service, so I had a, a very strong national perspective on, on how you do policy and how you deliver things. But actually, when you come to a place like Greater Manchester, you have the opportunity to join things up in a different way, and it, it unlocks a, a huge amount of um, opportunity it can be complicated, um, but actually it's the only way, I think, that you can get the real gains and, and um, the creativity and the intersections between um, different silos um, broken down. Can I, can no, I, no. Oh. no you, I, would, I would, but I, there's so many more questions. Yeah. Remember, you can, I'm sure you can find a way to segue. We're doing question time. I thought well, no, well, okay, go on, then, go on then, go on then. Kill a point from Andrew. Well, it was just uh, on, on the point of ageing. A lot of people think that ageing is about the people themselves who are ageing. Of course, that is what we tend to focus on. But an ageing society has implications for everyone. And one of the interesting stats is that grandparents spend more on their children, uh, their grandchildren than their children do. So what you might see in an ageing society is an increase in, in toy sales. And so, you know, there are bigger questions around the way that, say, apprenticeships and care and so on will happen, but we need to think about an ageing society as a, as a whole society, not just the consequences for those who themselves are ageing. Except but, there aren't as many children being born these days. <laughs> I still well, may spend more money on them. It reminds me of my favourite quote, which is Freud. Freud was once asked, why do grandparents and grandchildren get on so well? To which Freud responded, they share a common enemy. <laughs> um, uh, I'm just going to do another little poll, make sure you're all still with us. Uh, you've got to choose here between being either worried or excited. So uh, how do you feel about the health budget being devolved to Greater Manchester? Uh, if you're worried, put your hands up. If you're oh, one person at the back, <laughs> one single person at the back, thank you. And if you're excited by it, put your hands up. Okay, and if you're completely and utterly indifferent, you're in the overwhelming majority in the room. Okay, so uh, David Spendlove, uh, let's see if you can animate people. Where are you? Uh, uh, David has sent in a question, but he's unfortunately oh. not able to be here, so I will read it out. Uh, the question is, the number of students studying design and technology in secondary schools has dropped considerably over the last 10 years. Likewise, the number of teachers training to teach design and technology has dropped 50% below the national target in the last two years. Meanwhile, the government has continually marginalized design and creative subjects. Given the significance and importance of design, how can we resuscitate and reinvigorate the presence of design in education and skills at all ages? Thank you. STEM versus STEAM, I suppose. STEM versus STEAM, I guess. Um, now, by an amazing coincidence, I don't know how this has happened, it's, it's absolutely remarkable, we've apparently got a message which is an answer to that question from Dame Nancy Rothwell, the Vice-Chancellor of Manchester, <laughs> who's not here, but again, by another remarkable coincidence, is going to appear immediately behind me on the screen. Culture and arts are extremely important to any society and indeed to the partners of Manchester Corridor. At my own university, we're proud to have a museum embedded within the centre of the university and the Whitworth Manchester, which is our art gallery, that in fact has been nominated for the Stirling Prize later this month. So culture and arts are just as important to us as the STEM subjects and will play an increasingly important role in the future of the corridor. Very good. Now, Lou, can I be devil's advocate in coming to you on this question first, which is to say... When it comes to STEM, there is clearly a kind of market failure, which is there aren't enough engineers, there aren't enough scientists, there aren't enough coders. There's no shortage of people wanting to be designers or going to creative industries. There are hundreds. Of, what's, the, what's the problem here? <laughs> well, we're back to a conversation where the only value is if you want a career in it. So I don't know whether anybody listened to John, the John Peel lecture with Brian Eno a few weeks ago, but... You know, he, he said, you know, we're kind of locked in this conversation permanently about encouraging people to go into STEM because it's jobs, jobs, jobs. And obviously there is, there is an argument to say at some point you have to leave college and education and, and go and get a job. But you, you could, as Nancy's highlighting, maybe have both in your life and, and they both could add value. But I think, I think you know, there, there is this danger in presenting science as the only viable career for young people um, that... Uh, the nature of a career in design is changing anyway. So the notion that you study graphic design and go to be a graphic designer isn't the only way to have a career in design. So David and I were talking the other day about user experience design, for example, which to a huge amount of parents 
is a new notion. So, so that's quite a scary thing for me as a 16-year-old to come home and say, I'd like to be a user experience designer. I have no idea what that means, so therefore it's quite difficult for a parent to support the notion of, let alone where you go and study user experience design. And, and you know, so, so I think there's this whole wave of new careers that are opening up to do with digital and creativity and technology and design that largely don't mean anything to certainly one generation of, of parents, possibly even to young people themselves, because they don't necessarily know that there's a career behind that. So, so I think part of this is actually uh, exposing people to what will be the next generation of design careers and allowing people to make choices about the things that they might study and the paths that they might choose to, to pursue those opportunities and goals. Is there a confusion here, John, between design, capital D design, careers in design, design and technology as a subject, and design thinking, which many people might argue is a much broader concept, which all young people ought to learn, because it's really about asking the right questions, taking problems apart. Yeah. Well, um, you could be right, but let me just, let me just go back one, and, and thank you, Malcolm. I have been lumbered with the, being the figures man on this, um, on, on this panel. But oh, you're giving us more I'll, figures, John. No, I'm not going to. Okay, fine. Money. Settle back. But Settle I, back. What I am going to say is, that thing, I know, I know, I know. But, but things like doing this design economy report actually do make a difference because um, it, it's really important that design is seen to be something that is a, a, a really valuable and a, a sensible alternative. And um, the problem at the moment is that everyone sees the value of um, STEM subjects. Nobody sees the value of um, perhaps what are just seen as softer, less tangible less rewarding subjects in the longer term. And the more that we can actually get the communication across that actually this is a real driver of growth in the UK, uh, it's, uh, it, it adds real value and it's a very sensible alternative. That's the importance that we've got to get across. Um, but uh, you're right, you're right, um, uh, Matthew, that um, I think that design thinking should be taught as a, an alternative way of um, thinking about coming at solutions. And the more that we can actually get um, people uh, from a very early age thinking about um, real people and real problems, which is essentially what design thinking is about, the more I think that we're actually going to have a better society which is more prosperous uh, uh, and more well-meaning. Very good. I know, I'm, I'm going to push on because we were only halfway through our questions and we're more than halfway through our time. Does anyone from the audience want to talk about this question of design and education? Yes, very good. Someone in the front row. Wait for the mic. Wait for the mic. Here it comes. Tell us who you are. Uh, I'm actually involved in education. I work for uh, MMU and I was sitting here thinking what actually design meant to me and I was thinking about design craft and all these kind of things. And actually what I came up with uh, was was the concept of the fact that, to me, design is the interplay of function with, with aesthetics. What's, what's the panel's view in regard to that? Oh, defining design. OK, come on then, panel. One sentence, five words, come on. Desi oh, Two words. And, uh, go, go. Two words. Two words. For me, and this is my personal view... That's more than two words already. But well, that's my view. But the definition of design, mm. I think, is purposeful creativity. Hang on. So, pur 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 purposeful creativity. Very good. What was yours? Function? Uh, the, the sort of interplay between functions and aesthetic. In interplay between function. Go on, John. Okay, so I'm going to um, not do my, design, my definition, but do um, you know, a user's definition. So we've been doing some work with... Um, David at Manchester, um, looking at developing a design economy idea, which is a design academy idea, which is how do you get, how do you give kids that extra fillet that they need to make sure that they, when they hit employment, they've, they've really, um, you know, got all the tools at their um, armory. And we had a taster day and got people to fill out a little evaluation form. My favourite one was somebody who said, brilliant day, I now realise how design can make a difference to the way that people live their lives not just design the next piece of wallpaper, which is what my father thinks design is all about. Okay, good, but that's not a definition. But nevertheless, uh, no, 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 it's fine, no, it's fine. No, I'm, 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 no, it's, it, it, no, it's absolutely brilliant, but it's, yeah, yeah. Uh, a diff oh, okay, the diff a difference to the way people make that. Uh, right, Jessica, you don't have to do this if you don't want to, but do you have a definition? Well, I, I didn't come in with a definition. Oh. Um, but I think it's... Um, 
being able to do things well and beautifully. Oh, well, oh I, I'm, gonna, I'm saying you, I think you're Thank voting for functional know. aesthetic. I think that's a kind of more populist yeah. version of functional aesthetic. Okay. Um, who haven't I asked? Lou. Lou. Uh, well, I, I think at its most fundamental, it's ideas that solve problems. Oh, ideas that solve problems. I like that. Okay. Right, you, come on, you buggers. Just will you vo involve yourselves now. I want you to vote. I'm, gonna get, I'm, gonna, I'm giving you... I think we're going to give you... What the, no, no, wait, wait for the, no, just wait for the voting first. So I'm, I'm not going to include yours, John. I think it's a very nice difference in the way people live their lives, but it's too generic. I'm going to ask you to choose between three concepts. So I'll ask you to choose. You've got to vote for one of these three. Come on, you've got to vote. You've got to vote for this idea that it's fundament, fundamentally about function and aesthetic. What did you say? Yeah, yeah being able to do things beautifully. Doing things beautifully. Well and beautifully. Purpose, do you say purposive creativity? Purposeful creativity. Purposeful creativity. You vote, that's a lovely phrase, isn't it? Really or ideas that solve problems. Ideas that solve problems. Okay. All those who want to vote for the function and aesthetic idea, put your hands up. Right, seven, seven of you. Okay, all the people who want to vote for purposeful creativity. That's, that's, that's ahead. And who wants to vote for ideas that solve problems? Oh, there we go. Round of applause for Lou. Very good. You win the inaugural. Manchester Define Design in One Sentence competition. I will be giving you a cup later on. Um, okay, so now we move on to Alison Buckley. Here's the mic. Technology enables everyone to publish, broadcast, make music and design. What is the changing role of designers in the future? For example, um, I think that designers are becoming increasingly interdisciplinary. They're having to collaborate more. For instance, a uh, fashion designer may have to work with a coder for uh, wearable tech. So what is your um, view on the changing role of designers? Very good. And let's focus particularly, because it, we, we, we go very broad, let's just focus on that very specific question, John. I'll start with you. Do you think does the future design is, 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 is more specialism or more generalism? Um, I think it's more generalism, actually. Right. I think that um, what... Uh, what design and design, design thinking training can do is convene different skills and disciplines in a way that few other, few other, few other practices can do as well. Um, and the reason for that is, it, it goes back to Lou's point, it's about solving problems. If design has solving problems at its very heart and putting the user or the citizen or the human being at the center of um, what that is about, that has a way of pulling together um, different approaches in a very focused and concentrated way. And do you so, think? And, and do you think the design? And, 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 and Andrew, do you think the design uh, industry sector is sufficiently kind of eclectic in its approach? One of the another interesting conversation we have in the RDIs is that some more traditional designers aren't sure about service design. They're not sure it's proper design. Do you think we need to get over that? Well, I heard last week from someone who came back from New York where they were holding a global service design conference um, that the service designers in the room were finding themselves challenged by the, the UX designers and the business management consultants who had also attended the conference because they were saying that service design is no longer the future and that this broader, more hybrid concept was. So it was kind of interesting that just as the design kind of industry itself is starting to kind of open up to the possibility of service design, that service designers are being then threatened by a wider, wider sector. So I think, you know, design for me has always been incredibly plural, um, which is why it's so incredibly hard to define, because it is, of course, on one level, everything, and um, that makes it uh, both fascinating but also challenging, and, you know, you end up with these sort of bland platitudes. So um, I think the, the hallmark of design is that it, it evolves. It responds to new challenges and problems, which is why we also have a problem with design education, because we have to keep pace with the sense of change. When I used to teach, I used to say, to, probably badly, uh, which is why I don't teach anymore, but I used to say to the students in the first year, everything you learn this year will be absolutely useless to you by the time you graduate. Um, the pace of design changes, and you know, there may be some kernels of wisdom they picked up, but you know, the reality is design is, is, is shifting at a, a tremendous pace. So it is truly vocational. You never stop learning about design, and I think any designer in the room will recognize that you're only as good as the stuff you learned last week. 
Lisa, will, you, will, your, will your skills be redundant in a few years? I think, I think mine would be redundant a long time ago. It's difficult to employ people who are far more skilled than you. But I think that the role of the future role of design, I hope, it is that actually design will set the vision and the ambition and the, the mantra for companies and organisations. So I think what's really interesting about companies like Apple, who are have clearly achieved their success by being what seems to be a design-led organisation. If you look at Google I.O., last year the notion of Google holding its developer conference and the main topic being design, not the technology, that there seems to be a recognition now that actually the concept of design in its, in its broadest sense, whether it's service design, UX or whatever, you know, we're kind of, the currency is at the moment, it is, has a rightful place at a board table to set the direction and the pace of a company. And I think that that's quite a radical notion, you know, that for, for a long time, the biggest companies in the world did not consider themselves design orientated. So, so Jessica, can you ever imagine a, a, a banner outside the town hall that says Manchester Design Led Council? Um, I, do you know, that, that was just what I was thinking. And, and that, that sense of design led into public services and the way that we interact with the people that we're serving um, is, is absolutely needs to be there, I think. And the power of that would be tremendous if we opened ourselves to um, making that happen. And, and I think, um, you know, public services have struggle with this and particularly big ones um, and the idea that you go through a sort of um, project management process and you just find exactly what you want at the end and you follow a sort of prince methodology is so ingrained in what public services do and it delivers not great outcomes very often and I think that that um, design led um, approach has got a massive amount of merit in, in how we think about public services in the future but don't us underestimate the challenge of, of making that really happen um, within organisations And but I, I for one would love to see that happen I sometimes say that uh, I'm going to quote myself now um, in desperation but uh, I sometimes say that, that what are the differences between policymakers and service designers is policymakers hate it when something goes wrong because they've got to kind of start all over again and rip it up and report to the select committee whereas designers generally speaking quite like it when things go wrong because it's an opportunity to learn and do things differently but 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 growing a greater tolerance for doing things wrong amongst councillors and MPs and citizens and media is going to be a challenge it seems to me if we're going to fully exploit the potential of design okay anyone got any more thoughts on this concept yes at the back of the room and, and then we'll move into our last two or three questions. Hello, hi, my name is Hatton. Um, I'm a student at MMU. I don't think we can work in silos anymore. And the reason why I say that is that designers, for me, tend to be out of touch with reality. And they do need to have other people. If, if the point of design is to solve problems, I don't think the mindset that designers have, especially the ones that are trained to, to think in a design exclusive manner can solve those problems because they are not really focusing on what, what it means, what they are designing, how, what they are designing, how that is going to affect everyone else. We can't work in silos if we're going to solve problems using design. I think we all agree with that. Very good. Okay. Thank you for that. Great point. So, Alison, thank you for the question. Now, he's been referred to repeatedly all evening, but now he's actually going to ask a question. Malcolm Garrett. It's not short. I can't believe you've got to read it out. Do you want me to write it out? There we are. Very good. Uh, so, uh, I'm going to refer back to science has been mentioned a couple of times. Next year, Manchester is the European city of science. Uh, what does the panel think that this could mean for design and the creative industries in Manchester? Jessica, we'll start with you. Have you thought about design as a component of your of City of Science? You refer to science, City of Science in your strategy twice. <laughs> I'm so glad that you went through and word counted. It was a long train journey, of, to be honest. And it's a short strategy, I can uh, strategy. tell everybody uh, in the room, so do go and read it. Um, the, uh, I think that there's something really interesting when you start bringing art and culture and science together. And that's what cities were like. That's where interesting thinkers kind of came together as cities were forming. And there's no reason why that shouldn't be the case now. And, you know, in my early years after graduation, we had huge kind of arguments and debates between the scientists and the people who'd read arts and humanities. And actually, this was a 
this was a crazy debate to be having, and, and actually the, the way that those come together is really exciting. So um, when the Whit on the day that the Whitworth opened, there was a fabulous um, uh, evening spent here, which also which included a combination of art and science, and uh, the Nobel Prize winners for graphene um, engaged in a collaboration with Cornelia Parker to um, create fireworks that included graphene. Um, raised into the sky outside, you know. Actually, there's a, there's a completely a place for those two things together, and it inspires people, and it makes them think of new ideas and, and you know, interesting, exciting um, experiences. So, yeah, absolutely. John, have you, have, you, have you brought scientists and designers together through the auspices of the Design Council? Yes, we, <clears throat> we do it all the time. I think um, we do a lot of work um, working with uh, universities, particularly. Um, there's a... Uh, it's, oh, my God. Sorry. It's, I think it's one of those <laughs> classic... Turn your mobile phone off. Turn your mobile phone off. Yeah. It's one of those classic things in, in Britain is that we, we are a, a nation of great idea generators, um, but we don't necessarily always uh, take those ideas to fruition. And I think the, the unlocked IP potential that is sitting in universities, if you take proper design thinking and actually translate some of those ideas... Into uh, into real opportunities. There's a huge there's a there's a there's huge opportunities all over the place, and we do a lot of work. We've worked, we've worked over the years with about three quarters of the universities up and down the country to to, to do exactly that. And, and I will give you I will give you one statistic. Oh yes, I'll give you one Stack statistic, time. which is which is that you're 17 times more likely to get a Nobel Prize if, uh, if you've got arts and humanities as part of your background. So there we go. 17 times more likely. Oh, yeah, than people haven't. OK. Uh, now, um, Lou and Andrew, given that we've got two more questions and that people know that all that separates them from a glass of wine is you lot, uh, do, you want to add, <laughs> do you want to add anything to this question? Uh, perhaps a tiny bit of experience. Yeah, so in 20, end of 2013... I organised an event called Science Meets Design, and it was at the Design Museum and at the Science Museum. It was a simple concept. We then looked at designers and scientists, and I carefully organised it so to each of the venues there would be a mixture of scientists and designers. The idea was then that David Willits would go to the Design Museum, and then we'd put him in a taxi, and he would fly across the city and conclude the evening at the Science Museum, which worked beautifully, apart from a hurricane, which is a different story and too long. The problem was all the designers went to the Design Museum, and all the scientists went to the Science Museum. So my advice, if you've got this opportunity, is don't waste it and encourage people to get out of their comfort zones. Very good. I think Malcolm agrees with that. He's nodding. Lou, do you want to add anything? Uh, all I'll add is that, the, so I'm chairing the, the City of Science marketing team and having met all of the journalists and the people who are going to fly in from all over the world for this big event next year, largely they're not just interested in science. To, so to exactly that point, they want to go and see football games and they want to go and see amazing buildings and they want to go and see TV programmes, but, you know, they're, they're not just scientists and, and scientists, scientific journalists, you know, so I think... I think the worst thing you can kind of do is try and build design objects that are about science, you know, that we try and literally fuse art and culture with, because so, it generally is a bit of a mess. I think the most positive thing you can do is recognise that largely people have a broad palette mm -hmm. and want to see. So I, I hope all those people come away, not just making an association between Manchester and science, but Manchester and great design, which I guess is the challenge. We want to. Great, thank you, Malcolm. Um, now, we've got two questions left. The it's, things are going to heat up with the next one. Uh, Clive, Clive Grinier. There he is, a trustee of the, RS of the RSA. That's a, a, one of his many distinctions. Clive. By, by a spooky coincidence, uh, I also had an article published today uh, on the subject of uh, our European design heritage as a competitive advantage. It was uh, only in the Drum magazine, which has much smaller readership than your blog. <laughs> but um, the question is, we are asking serious questions of, of Europe and our relationship with it. What would be the impact on the creative industries if we left Europe? I think I'm going to, I'm going to exempt Andrew from to answer that question because he's a civil servant. Is, would, you, would you like me to do that? Yeah, of course. Good. Uh, John, 
You're partly funded by the government as well, so what do you, do you oh, want to answer? Oh, yes, well, no, I don't, don't mind answering. Uh, we, we also run a, a programme called Design for Europe, which is where we're actually looking at um, garnering the very best of design around Europe. And, and if, if we think that in some way Britain is ahead of the game, we, we've got quite a shock when you actually look at what's going on around um, the rest of Europe. Slovenia, for example... Um, applies design thinking to every single one of its public sector uh, decisions. Um, uh, so I think we would be poorer uh, not being part of the UK, not being part of the EU, uh, because of the, uh, the amount that we can actually learn in, in ways that we don't even realise uh, by sharing and participating in what is going on in the rest of Europe. Very good. Jessica, are you able to have a view on this? Um, I I'm not going to take it from a, from a design perspective, but I think um, for the city we would be poorer for not being part of Europe without the, the ability to um, welcome more people to the city to live, work and experience um, time in Manchester and that sharing of experience and the, the ferment that, that that creates in a city is important. Liz? Um, I guess not just specific to design, but you know, design, creativity as a discipline it is about new experiences and open minds and wanting to be exposed to new people and new ways of thinking. The idea of closing our borders being a good thing for that creative process is, seems, seems quite alien to me. Well, we're going to have to have a vote. We're going to have to have a vote. The kind of Manchester community of people who are designers who are interested in design, the referendum is going to be quite soon. Will you be voting to stay in the European Union or leave? Those who will be voting stay in, put your hands up. Those who will be voting to leave. Ah, one person, well done. I mean, I don't mean that I agree with you necessarily, but well done for putting your hand up. Um, okay, so it's a pretty overwhelming position then amongst the Manchester design uh, community. That's very interesting. Thank you for the question, Clive. Anyone want to comment on that? No. Okay. Final question. Professor David Crow. Uh, good evening. Um, my question is about the kind of wider understanding of design. I think we've demonstrated tonight that we've struggled a little ourselves with that. Organisations like the Creative Industries Federation, for example, are doing a good job in developing a voice for the arts like theatre, film, television, what we might call cultural industries. Design is obviously important there, but as we've heard tonight, it's important in a lot of other areas too. So how can we, as a community of people who are interested in design, how can we make sure that design is better understood nationally, by perhaps by the public, and better understood by policy makers? Okay, well, let's, that, that's, a, that's a great question. I'm going to kind of adapt it for each of our, our panellists. So I'll start with you, Lou. Do you think design is taken sufficiently seriously in the... Uh, business community in, uh, in Manchester? Uh, <clears throat> I think it depends which sector you're talking to. And, um, I mean, I always go to the Chamber of Commerce or regional CBI Institute of Directors, these kinds of people. Would they say, oh no, design is absolutely critical to the business? I, I don't think they're in the Apple Google place of design should lead the vision for the business. Uh, so I think there's definitely a kind of commerce piece to be done there to make people realise that it could contribute in a much bigger way, in the same way it could contribute to policy and to designing mm. solutions that, you know, now we've got control through devolution. It's definitely a, a, a commercial job, but I think there is... I think there's just a misunderstanding, probably, of what design is in the modern day, you know, yeah. at, at all levels, whether you're a 16-year-old considering it as a career or a 40-year-old running a company. You know, there's, there's, a, there's still an education gap as to how the principles and the design disciplines could help solve problems. So more could be done to raise the profile of design within yeah. the business community and the kind of business narrative. Andrew, your job is to get design taken seriously as a methodology uh, in government. Do you think, uh, where do you think we're standing on that? Uh, so uh, we launched a report that was done by the HRC by Lucy Kimball a week ago and it was an audience of policy makers and one of the policy makers made a very strong argument for more creativity in policy making and wondered why uh, we don't have policy designers rather than policy makers. And of course, the maker movement is also something that is of a strong um, you know, um, sense at the moment. Um, there is one thing that's really crucially important in this, and Christopher Rayling used to talk about this as the big D or the little D. But 
Angela Dumas says that 90% of design decisions are not made by designers. So, uh, like it or not, policymakers are making design decisions every single day. And I think then it's a wider question about how do you um, make good design decisions. And I'm much more interested in the small D design uh, rather than uh, perhaps the big D design. So I, I do, as we started the, pa the panel tonight, I think design has a role for design, and that's one community, but actually roles, the role of design across all of our social issues, across all government policies, is uh, far, far more interesting to me, at least. I'm going to come to you last, John, but uh, Jessica, what, what could the design community in Manchester do to raise its profile even more as a community? I think this, this kind of event's great, but I think it's how you start connecting this up with other sectors and other interests and really bringing, bringing it out of its own, um, out of your own discussions. And, and I see that um, quite a lot in all sorts of sectors. We, we, we feel very comfortable talking to people who um, are like-minded and understand what we're talking about and have their own definition of design. But it's when you start having those cross-sectoral discussions that, um, uh, that you can get some real, real traction. And I see that particularly within the environmental lobby, for instance. Um, they talk to each other very comfortably, but actually you need to break out and start convincing other people that um, taking a, a, a different approach to the environment and carbon and climate change change is, is where you need to be going. Same with the cyclist, cycling lobby, all sorts of groups, and I think this is, this is crucial. Um, I, I would also just like to say how important I think design is going to be um, as we look ahead for the city because we are fast growing. We've got a population which grew 20% over the period 20, 2001 to 2011. That pace, of cha that pace of growth is continuing and if we don't design well we'll end up with a city that is um, not, what, not the best that it could be and can't accommodate the kind of growth that we've, we've got in population and ideas and, and um, changing uh, changing um, business requirements and I, I think I think we need to think really hard about that but also design is critical for that point we made early on about equity and how we create a, a city that doesn't have um, growing polarization so I think I would welcome designers and design thinking being um, thought of in both the physical nature of the city but also how we live in it as um, as, as a group of citizens and, and residents. So I, what I'm getting from that is that part of the strategy for the design community is to form alliances with other groups. Yeah. Very interesting. Uh, John when you kind of ring up ministers and send them letters and say you must I must come and talk to you about the role of design are you being listened to is design being taken sufficiently seriously from your perspective? Sporadically, um, I think there are there are certain people who get it, and there are certain people who don't. And um, I think uh, I learned quite quickly when I started this job that what you have to do is you have to go in with a big statistic, and then you have to tell the story of the the firm that is uh, in that politician's constituency or the. Uh, the, the, the change that's been affected in prisons or in hospitals using design in their region, that's the way to do it, is to tell the big stories and the little stories, uh, which are both equally as compelling and engaging. I think, uh, I mean, the other big challenge that I think we've got, I suspect that um, this is a this really interesting debate tonight. We're all converted, or if we're not converted, 90, 95% of us are converted. And it's how do we reach the, the people who are not converted? Because somewhere in another room, um, there are people talking about innovation and growth and how smart technology or lean manufacturing or... Uh, industry 4.0 is actually the future and the design word isn't even being mentioned and it's how do we get into, so the point is collaborations, is how do we get mm. the design vernacular into other people's way of um, t communicating. Very good, I think there's an th interesting theme there across the panel. Well, uh, thank you all for your questions. I want to give particular thanks to the one person who's worried about Manchester running health and the one Eurosceptic for demonstrating <laughs> perhaps you two should talk to each other. You've got an important characteristic in common. Um, and thank you to the rest of you for your uh, questions, for sticking with us in this slightly cold room, but it's been really interesting. I think there's wine. Is there wine? There's, there's wine downstairs. Um, are you going to say anything? No, you're not. Very good. So... Uh, it just remains for me to I think the panel have been absolutely fantastic. So it just remains for me to ask you to join me in thanking our wonderful panel.
this tonight. Right. Cheers. Thank you very well.